Hello everyone, this is James Lindsay. You are listening to the New Discourses podcast. We're going to do something I never do. I never really respond to the majority of my critics because it's mostly a waste of time. I'd rather move forward than look backwards. I would rather produce new and valuable content rather than pouring over and giving attention to stuff that's usually not very serious. But today I'm going to make an exception. Today I'm going to talk about this article that came out the other day in the progressive Israeli outlet Haaretz um, opinion by, where's the author's name, Michael Nilsson, uh, which came out the 21st of March this year. And his opinion is Mein Kampf and the Feminazis. What three academics Hitler hoax really reveals about wokeness. So I'm going to talk about the Grievance Studies Affair, and in particular I'm going to end up talking about this Mein Kampf rewrite paper or papers that we did. But I'm going to just kind of go through Nilsson's nonsense here and do something I never do, which is respond to my critics. You'll love this. So we're going to talk about the Grievance Studies Affair, what was going on, and what is this thing about a... uh, rewrite of Hitler that got accepted by a feminist social work journal at the academic level called Ophelia. So the uh, little blurb beneath the abnormally long title of this essay reads, when a feminist rewrite, in scare quotes, of Hitler's autobiographical manifesto was accepted for publication, the stunt won breathless kudos from right-wing media stars. But what did the three academic provocateurs really, again in scare quotes, prove? And how does their prank fit into conservatives accelerating culture wars? Yeah, the culture wars are accelerating because of conservatives. Fuck off. Like, let me just say that from the get-go. The agitator with the entire culture war is the fact that critical theory won't quit. It's that critical theory keeps going. In fact, if you're going to characterize conservatives as reactionaries, which is what these progressives always want to do, what are they reacting to? They're reacting to the provocations of the progressive left, or in this case, specifically critical theorists. The second, I can almost guarantee you, the second critical theorists stop pushing all of this nonsense, it all stops. It's not conservatives creating this, and it's not even progressives trying to like overcome conservatism or something like that gone out of control, as they like to frame it up and say that it is. It is critical theory trying to reshape our society and people who value our society saying, no, we're not doing that. So I love this little framing here just from the beginning. How does this prank? This isn't a prank. We had a point. We'll talk about this. Fit into conservatives accelerating culture wars. Like this whole attempt right now to reframe things and put wokeness, the vestiges of wokeness, not wokeness itself, onto conservatives is a feature of the fact that (laughs) <laughs> the culture wars are not going as well, despite all of the ground that they've stolen, uh, claimed as a kind of a col- neo-colonialist project. The, the culture war is not going well for the woke. The brand is rotten. People are angry, really angry, and they see through it now. So now they have to claim that all this victimhood crap that they've been pulling, all this cancel culture stuff that they've been doing is really, or the whole culture war is really something the conservatives have been doing. They have to project it onto their enemy because everybody's mad as hell at them about it. So we're not going to let them get away with that. Well, let's just go ahead and read through Nilsson's um, brilliant piece. Maybe I shouldn't read all of it. I don't know how copyrights work. This thing does kind of exist behind a free paywall. You have to give them your email address to be able to read it. Um, But he says the scandal broke in the Wall Street Journal two and a half years ago. So why are you dredging it up now? The universities, the academia didn't do anything with the fact that they published a rewrite of Hitler. They didn't do anything with the fact that they published an absolutely farcical paper about dog sex that couldn't possibly be true and thought that it was an example of top-level scholarship in a discipline that shouldn't exist, feminist geography. They didn't reflect on any of the seven papers that were accepted. They didn't reflect on any of the probably four more out of the seven that were still under consideration that probably would have been accepted. They didn't reflect on any of it. So why are you bringing it back up now? It's an interesting question. But anyway, three self-described left-leaning liberals had fooled feminist and gender studies journals to accept a number of, quote, absurd and horrific, that's correct, 
Hoax papers for publication. Hmm, not really. Let's pause on hoax papers. I don't mean to do a close reading, but we actually put out a press release that begged people not to call them hoaxes. We didn't consider them hoaxes. As a matter of fact, here's what happened with the Grievance Studies Affair. And I know I get sick of talking about this, and I know people get sick of hearing it, but I'm going to say it again. My poor wife cannot stand having to hear this story told again and again and again and again and again. Thousands of podcasts or something, hundreds at least, that I've been on had to tell the same story. We started off the Grievance Studies Affair with the hypothesis that it would be possible to hoax these journals. And we started writing our first papers in August of 2017. And by November of 2017, we had convinced ourselves that it was not possible to hoax these journals. So what does that mean? Did we write hoaxes? Well, yeah, the first six papers we wrote were hoaxes. Every one of them failed. We got a uh, reviewers commentary sent to us from a reviewer for men and masculinities journal that busted our hoax that we had sent to them, which was about that everybody who does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is secretly gay. Uh, and that it is the masculine oppressive space in Jiu Jitsu gyms that prevents them from being able to express the fact that they actually all sports attracted men or sports interested men are latently gay and it's the masculinist cultures around gyms and sports that prevent men from just admitting the fact that they really wish they could be gay so they do sports instead well they saw right through the paper that it was horrifically badly researched it was a, it was a hoax it was totally fake the logic was bad the, the the results didn't follow one one from another we never read any of the source material and it showed and the reviewer caught us out on it that was the week before Thanksgiving or the week of Thanksgiving 2017. And, you know, we stared at that review and we realized the first of our research questions was answered. No, we cannot hoax these people, not in the sense of a pure outright outlandish hoax. They actually do know what they're talking about. It's just that what they're talking about is crazy. So the second aspect of what we did, and this is where all of our successful papers were, was that we tried to figure out what is it that gets published there? What can we get away with publishing? And in particular, can we publish sophistry? Can we start with our conclusion and then write the paper around the conclusion? Can we start with the conclusion and work our way to it, which is unacceptable scholarship? Can we make outlandish recommendations or dangerous recommendations or unethical recommendations? Can we violate basic premises of how scholarship should work? Can we uh, make non sequitur leaps? Can we make jumps uh, in, in logic that don't make any sense and still get these papers accepted and passed to reviewers? Can we present false data that's so transparently false and ridiculous that somebody should be able to at least ask questions about it? These are the kinds of questions that we were actually asking. And the answer turned out to be, yes, we can do all of those things, which should be an alarm bell going off. Uh, it turns out that this Hitler paper, we understood the impact of it, but we also understood that it was one of the least interesting of our papers. In fact, we tried to downplay it compared with the others. We mentioned it in the video that came out. We put it in the list and the media, of course, ran with it and went nuts with it. It's by far the uh, second most talked about of the seven papers that were accepted, whereas um, the dog sex paper was the first most for sure. And then all the other five that were accepted almost got no attention at all. And in fact, some of the papers that didn't get accepted, like the one that we recommended a progressive stack in schooling where we chain white males to the floor and ask them to listen and learn in silence so they can experience reparations and recommend speaking over them and not answering their emails and abusing them in class and things like this. That got more attention, but it didn't get in. It was on the road to getting in, but it didn't get in. And then another paper where we, uh, it didn't even, it's not even clear we could have rehabilitated it to get in, where we argued that um, men who think about a woman and masturbate thinking about her without her consent have committed a sexual assault against her, a metasexual act of metasexual violence, we called it. Uh, that got more attention than any of the five others that were accepted, um, with the possible exception of fat bodybuilding, which got some attention. But then we still are left with four that were actually accepted that barely anybody ever even paid attention to, one of which is actually much more important than any of these. But the point is that this Mein Kampf paper wasn't actually, we knew it would be a big deal. We, um, we gave it, you know, kind of 
200 to 1 odds. I remember us talking about that, of having a chance of getting in anywhere, and then realized that if it did, it would be a complete coup because the media would pay way too much attention to it. But knowing how much we actually modified the text, what we kept and what we didn't, um, we actually tried to downplay the significance of this one without trying to like hide it under the rug. We just kind of let things go as they would. So of course we're getting accused in this essay of um, focusing on this one particular paper, which is the only paper it talks about. He doesn't mention fat bodybuilding. He doesn't mention chaining kids to the floor. He doesn't mention any of the other ridiculous papers. He doesn't mention the dog sex. He doesn't, nothing else makes it through. Nothing about the ridiculous abusive data in the paper about Hooters restaurants. Nothing about um, the paper we had accepted by the leading feminist philosophy journal, Hypatia. They argued that you're not allowed to use mockery or humor to disparage or to put down or to challenge social justice or critical social justice in any regard because it's always unethical to make fun of social justice, in which we actually gave the criticism of our own project and we named ourselves in the paper <laughs> and titled the paper when the joke's on you. It doesn't mention any of these things. No, it just points out that uh, this was praised in some quarters, he says, as an essential satire of fashionable jargon and theories. No, it's way worse than that, actually. It is a satire, but it was much more a diving into the field. What well, When we called it, when we published it, we called it a reflexive ethnography. What that means is that you dive into a community or a culture and you feed them information that you think fits with it and you see how they react to it. So what we did was... While it is in the vein of satire, we entered into this academic community that publishes these kinds of papers, that traffics in this kind of nonsense, and we fed them amplified versions of themselves, let them give us feedback through the reviewers, and then amplified it further onto acceptance. He quotes Yasha Monk, I think writing for The Atlantic at this point, that... Um, these academic journals had an openness to publishing, quote, intellectually vacuous as well as morally troubling bullshit, which is absolutely true. Chaining kids to the floor <laughs> as an educational experience and being told by the peer reviewers that our problem was that we were centering, uh, that by saying that we approach this with, we should approach this with compassion and not abuse so that we don't tip into abusing these students literally, we should come at it compassionately. They told us that that recenters the needs of the privileged. That's morally troubling bullshit. In the dog sex paper, as hilarious and stupid as it is that we said that canine, what is it, dog parks are petri dishes of canine rape culture, that dog parks are rape condoning spaces, that we argued that dogs, we documented dogs crapping on each other and peeing on each other's heads, dogs were getting in fights and people were breaking it up by singing songs and doing jumping jacks. I mean, we put absolutely absurd stuff in there. We claim that we spent a thousand hours in three dog parks, never in the heavy rain in Portland, Oregon, over the course of a single year. There's a single researcher who took notes on all of this stuff while also inspecting 10,000 dogs' genitals and interrogating their owners on their sexual orientation to create this implicit bias test to find out if rape culture is reflected in the way that, <laughs> that human beings respond to watching dogs hump each other. Intellectually vacuous. But then we... That's also morally troubling because the conclusion we drew from this intellectually vacuous nonsense was, first of all, with absolutely nothing but the bare assertion. We said that we said that the dog parks are petri or are, are rape condoning spaces, just like human nightclubs. We gave no evidence that human nightclubs are rape condoning spaces, but that's in the paper anyway. That's morally troubling that we're just going to start accusing things with no evidence based on having watched dogs. But even worse was that the point, the conclusion that we started with to write that paper was that we should train men the way that we train dogs. Morally troubling bullshit indeed. So Yasha Monk is correct here. So um, making sure that we're fair and balanced. Uh, this essay then goes on to say, others slammed the author's hoaxes as mean-spirited attacks on leftist scholarship. We weren't mean-spirited. We were laughing our asses off, but we really what we were was alarmed. We were actually horrified. When we got the information back from the reviewers on the paper saying that we should use compassion when we chain kids to the floor, 
as an educational opportunity called experiential reparations, and that we should ignore white male students in their emails, and we should speak over male students to teach them a lesson. When we got the the information back, the comment back from the reviewer that said that we should not use compassion because it re-centers the needs of the privileged, we were horrified. This isn't a mean-spirited attack on leftist scholarship. This is like uncovering a rot in the midst of our knowledge production centers that's actually really alarming. We were torn between, you know, this being hilarious with the dog sex and the hooters and the crazy things we were writing and putting into the papers, and this being absolutely horrifying. That we were able to write a paper saying that you're never allowed to use humor against social justice initiatives, and they thought this was a, quote, excellent contribution to feminist philosophy. Very quickly turned that paper around and accepted it. That is alarming. This isn't mean-spirited. It's like people should want to know that this is what's going on And part of our underlying, we had a kind of a number of objectives with the project. Being mean-spirited was certainly not one of them. Exposing this to the public and making the public aware of it was one. Showing the extent of it was another. Um, Also proving, this is actually really important. I'll come back to the motivations later. But we were trying to also prove that we knew what we were talking about when we criticized leftist scholarship. Because up to the point where we uh, did this project, as we referred to it, the project, Up to the point where we did the project, the Grievance Studies Affair, we were criticizing this stuff in the usual ways, and we were being told, you don't understand it. You don't, all of us have heard this now, you don't know the material. Well, how how better to prove that you know the material and get a bunch of papers accepted at the research level? How many papers does it take to prove that you actually know this stuff? But this is true here, 11 of <laughs> anonymously, by the way, eleven of Bogosian's Peter Bogosian was was one of the colleagues on the project. Uh, Bogosian's Portland State University colleagues described them as quote fraudulent, time wasting, anti intellectual. That's right. So what happened was in the Portland State, the PSU Vanguard, which is a Portland State newspaper, student newspaper, eleven of his colleagues <laughs> and other professors and graduate students wrote this absolutely disgusting and ridiculous smear of Pete. Um, depicted him as some kind of cartoon villain, cl- depicted him in cartoon form as though he's poisoning the students, claimed all kinds of terrible things like that he was undermining uh, the quality of every degree in Portland State and that he was undermining the educational va- the value of the education there and r- subjecting the university to embarrassment, which is the opposite of the truth, um, for his own personal gain. And then they did this as a anonymous collective, claiming that they would get like death threats or something like that if they actually signed their name to it by then alleging, of course, that Peter and uh, Helen and I would go out and trigger trolls to, to throw death threats at them. Um, so he, he wants to drag that part up. Uh, it's really kind of a dishonest thing. But of course, here it is echoing that same dishonesty from the Portland State Vanguard. Um, it, <laughs> Nelson writes here, what is clear is that the hoax and its controversy propelled Bogosian and his co-writers into the media limelight big time with multiple articles in the mainstream press. Yeah, we were in like almost 500 newspapers worldwide, uh, including a print edition in Shanghai, uh, South China Daily, if I'm not mistaken, put our picture even. We were on the front page of the New York Times, you know, the the failing New York Times, which is obviously a horrific right-wing outlet. We were on the front page of that on October 5th. I have a copy of it, you know, a yard from me to my right where I'm sitting right now. Um... Multiple article in the main, that's what it says, <laughs> with multiple article in the mainstream press and a particularly warm welcome from right leaning platforms. Oh, there we go. Yeah, left leaning platforms wouldn't talk to us. I, we went on Oregon Public Radio. I talked to NPR and I had this long interview with them that I thought I was going to get stitched up, is going to get cut to like six or seven minutes for the usual thing. I thought they were going to do it. NPR treated it really well and fairly recognized the real problem. But who does he focus in on Dave Rubin's show, The Rubin Report, and Jordan Peterson's own YouTube channel? Oh, no. Uh, But also from more centrist outlets like Joe Rogan's podcast. Doesn't mention the fact that Vox wrote a smear of us after I went on the, uh, I had a 90-minute phone call with Zach Beauchamp who just asked all these weird leading questions and I knew what he was doing and then wrote this horrific smear. Uh, yeah, the, the, we went on right-leaning 
outlets because left-leaning outlets wouldn't talk to us. And if they did, it was almost always, but not quite always, malicious. The New York Times was an exception. NPR was an exception. Mother Jones didn't talk to us, but wrote a favorable article right away. Uh, and then <laughs> again, though, the right wing, right wing, ah, demons. Bogosian deep, uh, deepened his longstanding allyship with right wing provocateur Andy No. Yeah, that's one way to frame Andy No's work. Andy No has been working as an independent investigative journalist digging into Antifa. Um, and then go, and he has a book out about Antifa. You should, you should get Unmasked, I think it's called. Um, I talked to him about it when he was writing it, and I hope, I don't even know if I'm in it or not. I should check. But then it goes on and he says, and won a phalanx of new fans from Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins was already a friend of ours, to Barry Weiss, um, and, and Andrew Sullivan, to Megyn Kelly. So these are the demons that he's invoking. Um, Megyn Kelly kind of just came onto the scene paying attention to us very recently, by the way. Uh, so I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's how this actually works. But nevertheless, this is the heart of the matter, though. Let's get straight to the heart of the matter. But did the trio, Nelson writes, but did the trio really demonstrate that, the, that contemporary academia is receptive to a, quote, intersectional Mein Kampf? What did the stunt actually prove? What were the underlying motivations of the hoaxers? I'd love to know how he's going to figure those out. And the conservative media stars who embrace them so eagerly. Jesus. What light does this saga throw on today's culture wars and the so-called anti-wokeness and cancel culture campaigns? Whom did the three writers really hoax? He really writes that. That's He's going to get to the bottom of it in this, this super progressive idiot article, I'm sure, um, where he's going to assume our motivations and he's going to assume the motivations of the conservative media stars who embraced us so eagerly. This will definitely show throw light rather than a stupid progressive obfuscation cloud over what's going on with the culture wars and anti-wokeness and cancel culture campaigns. And of course, he's going to conclude that we actually hoaxed ourselves, right? Hoaxed ourselves. We weren't even writing hoaxes, by the way, but nevertheless, um, he says that our, our aim was that we claim to, quote, reboot the academic conversation and re reintroduce skepticism about core assumptions, provide a safe space to challenge the increasing power of grievance scholars. That's true. Um, that is true. We did want to try to reboot the academic conversation. We wanted academia to take seriously the fact that we were exposing a massive rot. We also wanted people to take seriously the fact that we knew what we were talking about when we criticized this stuff. Everybody said, well, you don't understand it. You just didn't read the papers right. We've all heard these excuses. This is Critical Theory 101. Accuse people who disagree with you of having not understood it. How many examples of this do we have to give? We can talk about, you know... Let's just go into the little litany of them. Of course, you have people like Robin D'Angelo that argue that if you disagree with her stuff, you have white fragility. So there's something morally wrong with you. You're fragile. You don't have the racial stamina, the racial humility to engage in your anti-racism work. Okay. Then we have people like Barbara Applebaum who writes that, that people are free to disagree with critical scholarship so long as their goal is to understand it better, which means you can't really disagree with it. Any other disagreement is not okay. One of our own papers was that you can't make fun of it. This was considered an important contribution to feminist scholarship. Uh, feminist philosophy, I should say. Um, we have uh, Alison Bailey, who says that, that disagreement is not legitimate and is, in fact, an attempt for the uh, for the, the dissenter to maintain their privilege. The concept is called privilege-preserving epistemic pushback. We ran into that experientially. We tried to criticize this stuff. We tried to have conversations about this stuff. We tried to write about this stuff. And what we consistently got told is you don't understand it. I was like, okay, fine. We don't understand it. We're going to go learn it. We're going to go spend a year learning it. And we're going to prove that we learned it by getting papers published. So we did. So he observes correctly. Also, over a period of 10 months, they wrote 20 papers. That is correct. Seven were accepted for publication. That is also correct. Four were published. That is also correct. Um... And then he says to excavate the controversy and as a historian studying Hitler. And I've chosen to drill down. I don't know why that hand is there. I've chosen to drill down into one of the hoax articles. Our struggle is my struggle. Solidarity feminism as an intersectional reply to neoliberal and choice feminism. The piece flagged by the Wall Street Journal as being based on Mein Kampf. 
It is based on Mein Kampf. We took chapter 12 out of Mein Kampf. I did. I read Mein Kampf to find a suitable chapter that could be translated from the modern, angry modernist language of, of Hitler into something that resembles a postmodern scholarship argument, right? All of this book, which is mostly a first-person account of how Hitler's pissed off at everybody in the universe, and particularly the Jews, but also the communists and half of everybody else, uh, is not suitable. We is not at least easily suitable to turn into a not first-person account of the, the scholarship, right? That looks like an argument for something rather than him talking about how mad he is about everybody. So anyway, he correctly chronicles it was sent to the feminist the, to the journal Feminist Theory, but was rejected. It did go to peer review there, however, which shocked us. Uh, it was then accepted by Ophelia, Journal of Women and Social Work, in the fall of 2018, but never actually published. That is correct. On the Rubin Report, James Lindsay airily hypothesized that it was probably days away from actually being published when the Wall Street Journal broke the story. I didn't airily hypothesize that it was typeset by the journal which is the last thing that happens before they publish it they the the version that we have was typeset by the journal we didn't typeset it the journal did so when you submit an academic paper it goes through this long review process the editor reads it they take some days if they like it enough they send it off to peer reviewers peer reviewers can, can spend months with it sometimes uh, one of our papers was under peer review, sent off to the reviewers for something like 12, almost 11 months. I mean, it's out there forever. Um, very long that the reviewers can have. Then it can come back. Then it comes back to you with recommendations from the editor and the reviewers. You change it. You send it back. If they are willing to take it back, you change it according to their directions. You send it back. You have to defend what you did to change it, explain what you did to change it, and then they evaluate that. Sometimes the peer reviewers get involved again. Sometimes it's just the editor. Then they accept the paper if it's going to be accepted. And then there's this other waiting period while they typeset the paper, and then they provide you with the typeset proofs, and you go through and you edit. Uh, you approve any final like typographical changes especially. You make sure all of the P's and Q's are in order, the, the T's are crossed, the I's are dotted, and every other thing. Once it's typeset, you're usually less than a week from publication. This occasionally slips or something delays it. So I wasn't airily hypothesizing. It was literally right before the Wall Street Journal broke the story that we received the uh, typesetting. Uh, the, the, the proofs to approve. So this isn't airily hypothesizing. Um, I hate this dishonest journal, uh, journalism form where you're just going to inject crap like this. By the way, the author, of course, and nobody does this. I don't usually do it either, So I'm not, but I'm not a journalist. The author did not contact to find out what was the context behind that. But the, the story is not being told accurately here. So... Um, what does he write? You know, what does based on Mein Kampf actually mean? Because uh, he says it is an appalling prospect. This is also broken, though. The idea that an article based on Mein Kampf could be published in a serious scientific journal is certainly an appalling uh, prospect. Well, it's not a serious scientific journal. Are you even paying attention? Journal of Women in Social Work? Are you even paying attention? This is not a serious scientific journal. I don't even think you're qualified to write this article. It is a social work journal that comes from a feminist theory perspective. There's nothing scientific about any of that. Not a single piece of that is scientific. Is it a serious journal? Well, I leave you to decide that. I don't think it's a serious journal, but it is actually a real academic journal that actually does publish papers that people do actually cite and that people do actually read. Uh, it's certainly not a scientific journal, though. Um, so what does based on Mein Kampf actually mean? He says, first and foremost, the source material, the chapter, the hoax. This is my, this is the part I real. this is the part, actually, this paragraph right here is the, what made me record this episode of the New Discourses podcast. Okay. First and foremost, the source material, the chapter, the hoaxers chose not by coincidence, one of the least ideological and racist parts of Hitler's book. It's not even a sentence. Uh, he left out the verb, but anyway, chapter 12, which I already claimed was the one. And I just told you a few minutes ago why I chose chapter 12, probably written in April, May, 1925 deals with how the newly refounded. I love this. This is so dishonest deals with how the newly refounded NSDAP should rebuild as a party and amplify its program. 
Okay, so we have a historian dealing with Hitler, right? And he's writing this, this thing. First thing he points out here, what does based on Mein Kampf actually mean? The first thing he does is he tries to point out that this chapter, chapter 12, isn't that bad. Okay, then he doesn't even deal with the situation honestly. So I'm going to deal with the situation honestly. So deals with how the newly refounded NSDAP should rebuild as a party and amplify its program. As we've learned many times so far on the um, New Discourses podcast, I'm not that good at the original German, but what is the NSDAP? So I went to my favorite not Google search engine and typed in NSDAP. That's all I typed. Press enter. What's the top result that comes back? Wikipedia, Nazi party. Yeah, it's so NSDAP stands for National Socialistisch Deutsch uh, uh, Arbiter Party. In other words, the Nazi party. The National Socialist German, I don't know what Arbeiter means in German party. Uh, anyway, the point is, this is the Nazi party. But why didn't he just say that? Why did he hide it behind NSDAP, which obviously most readers would not recognize? Why didn't he just call it the Nazi party? All right, dishonesty aside, subtle, like tricky dishonesty aside, let's play a game. We have, we have this, <laughs> this book, this pretty horrific book, and I think we're going to be able to come back to this. Uh, he does actually, let me just fast forward to where he talks about chapter 11, right? So he says, um, chapter 12, he noted included sentences like, and these are me being quoted from me talking to Ruben off the, or Rogan, I think off the cuff, not me quoting. It doesn't actually include these sentences. This is why we need the Nazi party. And this is what's expected if people are going to be a part of it. That's the theme of chapter 12 of this book. And what did we change? Well, and in, in my own words, apparently we took, we took that out, meaning the Nazi party reference and replaced it with intersectional feminism. That's true. That's what we did. I'll tell you how we wrote the paper in a second. What's left is a completely anodyne sentence stripped of any identifiable na Nazi vestiges. Okay. So whatever. Um, where does he talk about chapter 11? Okay. If the idea was to showcase the absurdity, that's in scare quotes, of feminist theory and the ideology fueled laxity of the editors, it isn't actually what the point of this paper was. We can cover that too. Why didn't they choose to work from a much more ideological or racist part of Mein Kampf, say chapter 11, Folk and Rasa, People and Race, instead? Well, Lindsay told Ruben revealingly it was too extreme to be useful. Yeah, have you? Refer, it's also in the, kind of a lot of the first person. You should read chapter eleven of Mein Kampf sometime. He, we actually did a keyword search for Jews. I think it appears in the chapter something like three hundred and fifty-seven times, if memory serves me correctly. He absolutely rails on the chapter on Jews in chapter eleven. Okay, so chapter eleven is the nasty chapter where Hitler has spent now ten chapters getting more and more pissed off at all of his different political enemies, and he just lays into the Jews, race, people, and race. Uh, you know, German folk, folk and Rasa. So he's now going to lay into race. He's going to lay into the Jews, rips them all through chapter 11. And then what's chapter 12? <laughs> we need our movement back. Why? He just spent 11 chapters or 10 chapters, I should say, complaining about his struggle, Mein Kampf. That's what that means in German. My struggle, his grievances, airing his grievances in a mostly first person account. He spends 10 chapters, gets to the chapter 11, lays it all out that the Jews are the problem, moves on to chapter 12, the one we rewrote, and says we need a movement. The least ideological and racist part of the book. Are you missing something here, Mr. Nilsson? Are you absolutely out of your mind? He spends 11 chapters, the last of those 11 chapters, absolutely railing on the Jews. And then chapter 12 is the beginning of the solution to that problem in his eyes. And that's the one we, re we rewrote. In and of itself, taken separate from any anything else in the text, sure, it is less ideological and certainly less racist. It is not less angry, um, except maybe than the super angry chapter 11. But it's Hitler's solution, <laughs> which has... Hitler's solution is a phrase that has some historical significance uh, to the problem of the Jews that he just spelled out in the previous chapter. So, sure, remove chapter 12 from its context in the book and you can make this argument. 
put chapter 12 in the context of this book, and not only are you absolutely mental for trying to say, oh yeah, the least bad part of Hitler, and defending it, just so you can own me, you are actually missing the whole point of what's so bad. Hitler writing an angry book that rails on the Jews and doesn't call for a movement with, you know, actionable plans to make that movement isn't going to lead to what this led to. Chapter 12 is the opera, operationalism, or opera, opera, pfft, I, why do I fuck up at least one word every single time I try to record a podcast? Operaza, operating, Jesus, you know what I'm trying to say. Operation. It's gone. It's totally gone. Laugh at me. Let's laugh together. Okay. It's where you put into operation the idea of uh, creating the Nazi party. <sighs> so this this defense, besides being slightly dishonest, is just hilarious. It's, it's embarrassing. And that this appeared, I know it's a very progressive one, but this appeared in an Israeli outlet is just absolutely f- mind boggling, but you know, they'll, they'll totally own me. Um, so here's what, here's his description. And then I'll give my description of how, how we actually wrote this paper. Uh, cause this was the hardest one we wrote. Um, I think it actually almost tore us apart. So here's some inside secrets about the grievance studies affair. I was in China while we were doing the actual, uh, last round of forcing this paper to exist. Uh, and, Helen and Peter were left to work with one another directly because I didn't have time and I was in China and I just wasn't having it. And I just said, you know, I'll be gone for two weeks, deal with it. And they nearly killed each other <laughs> trying to edit back and forth one one to another over this paper because it was so difficult and their writing styles and their approaches are so different. Their personalities are so different uh, that without me as a mediator, it was a total mess for them. It was really kind of funny in retrospect. It was really stressful. I'm getting all this crap. I remember you know, heading to the airport to go to China and having a text message from Pete. Don't even think about any of this, bro. Don't even think about it. Two weeks off, you deserve it or whatever. Don't even think about it. And I remember getting on this, you know, series of flights, the last one of which is like 14 hours. And it's a long ride to where I finally could get to Wi-Fi and and connect to the internet and see if I had any. First thing I have (laughs) is messages from Helen. I've blocked Peter on all lines of communication. (laughs) I can't stand him. It was like one day. Oh my God. And then I was gone for two weeks dealing with this. Anyway, it was a hard thing to write is the point. So here's the summary given here. According to their own account, the writers took parts of the chapter and inserted feminist buzzwords. Um, No, that's not what we did first. Quote, he says, they quote, significantly changed the original wording and intent. No. Well, maybe I guess if that's in quotes, we must have said the original wording and intent. Like I said, we did try to downplay this. Um, certainly we were not trying to make it an anti-Semitic track. However, we were trying to make it a, uh, intersectional grievance track. And so of the text to make the paper publishable and about feminism. So there's the intent, right? About feminism, intent, feminism, original wording had to be changed to make it publishable. Why? Because first of all, Hitler was a modernist. Most of the scholarship is postmodern. That's a problem. You have to correct for that problem. Number two, you have to actually make it be about the subject that you're talking about. Number three, uh, you have to make it fit. (laughs) You have to make that actually work together, right? It's like you can't just take out words and put in other words because then the sentences don't make sense and the paragraphs don't make sense. And then because it's a scholarly paper, you actually have to ground it in and build it out of the existing scholarly literature in that subject, or it isn't going to count as a scholarly paper in that subject. So of course we had to change the original wording and intent. Um, so he says an observant reader might ask what could possibly remain of any Nazi content after that? But no one in the media apparently did. Well, that's kind of true. Um, a lot of people didn't ask that many questions about it uh, because it's already scandalous enough and it is a complicated thing. We did, however, on many podcasts, so not no one in the media, explain this. And I can remember explaining it to journalists a couple of times and them just kind of glazing over. And like, that's too complicated for a op-ed. Yeah, no kidding. I know. So here's how we wrote the paper. I'll t- lay out the whole story of how the Mein Kampf paper came into being. It turns out it wasn't our first attempt at a Mein Kampf paper, so maybe I should tell the story in full. We had this idea to rewrite horrible, awful, old things. I think it was Helen's idea, honestly. I would love to take credit for it, but I'm pretty sure it was Helen's idea. And her original idea was we find some, because we wanted to show that it has a religious nature to it. Uh, Some horrific, old, you know, kind of railing, angry theology tract that's just very, very overtly kind of the worst angry, Puritan, whatever religious thing you could possibly imagine. 
and then to kind of show that they're like preachers. And of course, it didn't take long for us to figure out Mein Kampf. You know, you don't get something more horrible than that. So let's use it. And um, we started looking for things to do. And Peter had an idea. And what he did was he just took a a document containing the text of the book, started keyword searching Jews, and he click, click, uh, clipped out 3,000 or so words worth of sentences that roughly told a first person story. Hitler's book is mostly what the scholars today call it, call an autoethnography. He's trying to give an ethnographic account based on his own experiences and struggle. Now, they kind of unironically published these things now, not realizing that Hitler was really kind of, in a sense, one of the first really big autoethnographers. And anyway, we tried, so we took this and Peter, the first one that we wrote, We did take the word Jew and replaced it with white, and then we started editing around that, and then we tried to turn it into a cohesive narrative, and then we um, tried to sell that as an autoethnography about a young woman discovering uh, basically that whiteness was the root of all evil, and um, that paper did not get accepted. It did go to peer review, but it did not get accepted. Uh, it's difficult to place autoethnographies as it is. Um, the second attempt, because I said we did three, was that we were like, well, if we're going to do one with race, why not try one with with feminine uh, feminism? So then we just took the exact same thing and we took out white and put in male and just tweaked the details to make it work. This is this, These were pretty close to Hitler. And at the same time, we had to retain as much of Hitler's original language as possible. But these weren't really going well. And we thought that it might work better to not have an autoethnography because autoethnographies are hard to get published anyway. So I began to read all of Mein Kampf to try to find a suitable chapter that would make an argument-based paper rather than a first-person account-based paper. And that was around Christmas when I was doing that in 2017, and I stumbled across uh, chapter 12 by the time I got to chapter 12, um, and realized this chapter will probably work. And so I then, this is how the paper that got accepted and was literally days away from being published came to be. I took the entirety of that chapter and I copied it and I pasted it into a Word document. Then I went through and everywhere that this is the only thing I did on the first pass, everywhere he mentions, Hitler mentions our movement, I replaced it with the phrase just blindly intersectional feminism, whether it was our movement specifically or something in context. And the sentences obviously didn't make sense. So I just went through and did that. Then I went through and I started to tweak the sentences so that they actually made sense, which also required us to where he would talk about his different enemies. And I would just, I took out, you know, he'd talk about the communists or he'd talk about some other group that he was mad at, and I would just take that out and put it put it in brackets, enemy, because we didn't know what the right enemy was going to be yet. And so then I just kind of made all this work, you know, vaguely making it work, left most of Hitler's original language. We knew in both of these, or all three, I guess, of these cases, there's really just two cases and two iterations on one of the cases. And we didn't even try that feminism one, really. We submitted it to one journal one time and didn't try again. We just threw it away. Um, but in, at any rate, we knew all along that eventually these might get subjected to a plagiarism check. So we actually looked up how these things worked and we found out that one of the main ways that they check for plagiarism is anytime you have three identical words appear in a row, it get, it can get flagged. And so we knew we couldn't retain three identical words in a row exactly as they were. So we had to deal with that somehow, but we didn't do that yet. So what I had done then is I had taken out our movement, which means NSDAP, in other words, Nazi party, or our, he didn't call it a Nazi party. He called it our movement or the movement or something similar to this. And I replaced that with intersectional feminism without any real depth, replaced whoever he was mad at, even when it was the Jews with enemy. So I kind of flattened all of his Hitler's enemies into one thing that was just enemy. And then I sent this off to Helen. And Helen had a much more thorough understanding of the uh, intersectional feminist literature at the time than either Peter or I, this being about December of 2018, like I said. And I let Helen read it, 
and asked her, will this work? And Helen's response was, yes, I think so. And I think I can figure, I think I know what I can ground it in, but I have to do some reading. So Helen went off and read a special issue of a academic journal that was all dedicated to what's known as neoliberal and choice feminism. It's two different kinds of feminism. Turn out there's like a million kinds of feminism and they all hate each other. But at any rate, she was like, yes, this will work. The intersectionalists are very, very opposed. And they use the idea of solidarity, which Hitler is ultimately kind of calling to solidarity within his movement, the Nazi party. They're very, very opposed to choice feminism, which is the idea that a woman is being feminist if she's been, you know, liberated by equal, liber, liberated to equality and then lives her life as she wants. A woman making her own choices in life without the restrictions of a patriarchal system to guide those choices. Therefore, if she wants to, you know, dress pretty, if she wants to dress kind of slutty, if she wants to do porn, if she wants to model, if she wants to, you know, do whatever she wants to do, if she wants to drink Coca-Cola and chew bubble gum and drive real fast. If she wants to lift weights, whatever it is, you know, all these things that we've seen, if she wants to be a rebel and call that empowerment, that's choice feminism. And man, do the intersectional people hate it. Uh, in fact, these articles in the special issue of this journal, for, I think that was from 2008, and I don't remember which journal it was now. I remember certain of the authors within it, but they they call it choosing betrayal, <laughs> betrays all the other feminists. The, the theme is the same. It's betraying. Hitler would be, you know, these people are betraying our movement here. It's betraying feminist solidarity. So we write this, Helen's like, this will work. And so she goes through and kind of like fits it all together. And then we realized like the, you know, we kind of went through and massaged it, make sure it worked. We'd tuck in a sentence of, of academic literature or a citation or whatever, you know, a quote backing up what was Hitler's words and then just putting oomph behind it to make sure that it tied Hitler's words reframed into intersectional feminism and solidarity therein. And then we'd put a quote saying, you know, why it was important or setting up the next paragraph, which would be Hitler's paragraph or something like that. And this happened pretty much, you know, in between every sentence or every other sentence And certainly here and there, we'd add just a paragraph to smooth it over. We also realized that it wasn't going to work just as it was because Hitler just launches into this railing attack. And so the next thing we did was we wrote an introduction that was wholly us, about 3,000 words of setting up the the introduction to the paper and the grounding in the literature and the direction it would take, which was why allyship is not enough. And so then about 3,000 words into the existing paper, it turns all Hitler. This turned out to make the paper too long. So when we, one of the next things we had to do was then take... So Hitler in, in chapter 12 has something like 14 points. He enumerates like 14 points or 13 points or something like this about how the Nazi party has to be organized. And so we condensed those down. Some of them we just deleted. Some of them we combined. We condensed them down to eight points to an eight-point plan. And then... Because they made more sense in terms of the paper, we changed their we we mixed up the order of them. We put them in a different order that flows better for the kind of argument that we we're making, so it looked like a kind of more structured thing. All right, so now we have to come back to the sentences because of the plagiarism. So what we did was we changed words out for their synonyms. We took words out and replaced them with synonyms or with close enough synonyms. We took out words and replaced them with phrases that mean roughly the same thing. We would take phrasing that Hitler had and reorder the words so that it says the same thing, but that we change the order of the words in the sentence. Um, So rather than saying something that maybe goes along the lines of there are many among us who, it would be something like uh, among those of us who care, you know, such and such. There are many, you know, we we just reorder the words to get around a plagiarism check. And we really did lots of synonyms. It was spent a lot of time in a thesaurus to make this and then just making it work again. So um, the characterization of this article does not take into account any of what we actually did to make that work. (laughs) There was actually a lot of work to make that work. And all throughout, we had a couple of overarching uh things on in our minds that made it uh, in, in mind which made it really difficult okay so some of these things that we did that made it very difficult were that we very intentionally tried to maintain Hitler's tone his very angry 
very absolutist, very totalitarian mood and tone. We amplified that by keeping certain among his actual phrases, like no half measures. Uh, you know, we have this. Um, he, here's here's the summary we have uh, from Nilsson to appeal to stuff contented and satisfied stuff to embrace stuff half measures by stuff a so-called objective standpoint so we're putting in these kind of like trig these keywords that point that we actually are talking Hitler that is to say stuff in the sense stuff many limitations stuff countered only by an antidote stuff and so we kept this kind of angry tone all throughout and we kept as much of Hitler's phrasing as we could. Here we even have a few places where there's six or seven words in a row, knowing that we weren't supposed to keep more than three. So we worked really hard to keep as much of Hitler's original language as we could, but more we kept his tone, his ethos, his his anger, his vibe, and in most importantly, his reasoning. Okay, so the reasoning of Hitler is identical. There, It's actually identical. The reasoning is that we need to have this movement People need to make massive sacrifices for it because we're going to reclaim, you know, a proper identity politics for Germany. Our paper was, we need to have this movement. It needs to operate in solidarity. Anything that, that distracts from the movement and moves back to the individual is inappropriate and wrong. And we're going to have a solidified movement that's going to bring us to liberation from all oppression. Uh, the rationale is the same. The logic is the same. The anger is the same. The mood is the same. The a, a lot of the wording is the same. The sentence structure is maintained as similar as often as possible. So this is how we actually wrote the paper. Um, we really did try to stick to it as much as we could given the constraints that we were going to be under. That said, how did we come out of this? Um, Helen and I were very Helen most of all so all three of us were concerned about this Peter Helen and I were concerned about it but in different amounts Peter was least concerned I was middle concerned and Helen was very concerned that we would overstate our case by saying that this was was a rewrite of Mein Kampf but we also had to compete with the idea that we had to communicate what we did in a way that's comprehensible to the general public so calling it a rewrite of Mein Kampf which is literally what we did uh, maintaining the reasoning, maintaining the the anger, maintaining the vibe, maintaining some of a significant amount of the language. I actually, at one point, and I don't know what happened to this document. I actually went through with the final draft that we had and with the uh, original text from Hitler and put the relevant passages side by side. It works out that something like about forty five percent of the overall words. Um, are in direct parallel. And when you read them side by side, it's undeniable that it's the same thing, that, that we just transliterated from one to the other. And so uh, I don't know what happened to that document. We had to publish it at some point, but we couldn't figure out the formatting or something like that, how to put two documents side by side on a website and make it readable. So that's the true story behind the Mein Kampf paper. And of course, this thing rails and rails and rails to so say that that's not what we really did. Uh, and everything just failed, and we really hoaxed ourselves. Um, he gets in his digs at all of his favorite enemies. He's already hit Ruben. He's already hit Jordan Peterson. He goes after right-wing pundit Ben Shapiro called the stunt genius because it was. I mean, I'm not even going to be falsely humble about this. It was freaking brilliant to, to have pulled this off. It was the hardest writing thing that I think I've ever done. But he was talking not just about the paper, this paper. He was talking about the project itself and the whole grievance studies affair. Um, which, <laughs> which um, Ben Shapiro referred to as navel gazing mental masturbation, and he said that the project was geared toward a renewed intellectual search for knowledge. That was part of our goal. Uh, he takes a stab at Quillette. Um, he takes a stab at uh, Swedish Sweden's second largest daily newspaper. Uh, I'm going to mess this up. Sven, is it Svenska uh, Dagbladet? Uh, 
It featured an editorial headline, The Feminazis at Our Universities, and it went downhill from there. It doesn't say how it went down. Uh, wait, it does. It says, we didn't bother to ch- didn't bother to fact check his claims about the Mein Kampf piece. Isn't that hilarious, given that the author of this did not actually fact check a damn thing. Uh, in fact, he's got some things correct, but he's also pretty uh, horrifically wrong. Feminazi, he points out, and I think this is hilarious, um, I laughed and laughed, was the go-to slur for feminist coined by right-wing Christian shock jock Rush Limbaugh back in the 1980s. Um, I, I laughed that the paper kind of confirmed that Rush Limbaugh was onto something. And he goes on and on just kind of like trashing different people here throughout the rest of this thing. Uh, but he says that we did this... Um, it is best seen in the hoaxers parsing of their own stunt as they bathed in the glow of right-wing adoration. We should have really received left-wing adoration too, but the left isn't doing real good with uh, self-reflection these days. Um, but he says that this is embedded within these wider culture wars and is revealing about the dynamics and the strange, strange-looking self-declared liberals and right-wing alliance pushing so much of the outrage machine. No, 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 no. No, we're not pushing the outrage machine. We are outraged that you are pushing the outrage machine, and we're not going to take this accusation. Every person that I know that's a classical liberal or traditional left liberal who's not woke or a progressive, and every conservative I know would love to set all this down and get on with life. We will all want this to just shut up and go away so we can get on with our lives. I said repeatedly, I don't want to be doing any of this. I think it's fun that I got to do this in a sense, but I don't want to be doing any of this. I'm eager to retire from this entire pile of mess, and I will do so once the woke left, whatever its next incarnation might be, stop pushing all of this garbage. Um... So it's not appropriate to project this onto us, which is somewhere that I started earlier. So he accuses us, he says, Lindsay on the Rubin Report offered an explicit analogy between Mein Kampf and the so-called leftist grievance studies. He claimed that Hitler too was pushing the politics of grievance. That's correct. It's the same politics of grievance. Let me just lay this out for you. Hitler's anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism in general is, is a conspiracy theory that says, hey, look, there's this race. They're part of our culture and they have erected themselves as the privileged members who hoard resources and they have these nefarious plots to keep other people down and to maintain their own dominance and control and they help each other but they don't help others. This is whole idea, right? And he's got this grievance against it says that's what's causing, causing Germany to be terrible. Guess what? We come over to wokeness. There's this racial group called white people who, by the way, Jews are a part of. They're, by critical race theory, they're named as white. Uh, and they have all the power and privilege and they keep it to themselves and they hoard resources and they try to um, keep other races down and keep them out and so that they can maintain their own power and dominance. Um, It's the same warmed over BS. It's not even just the politics of grievance. Wokeness is actually just warmed over Nazi ideology that's been tied in somehow into this weird mishmash with neo-Marxist approaches to communism and outright, uh, you know, classic corporate fascism. Uh, it's like all the worst ideas of the 20th century smashed together and then uh, unleashed on the world. Um, so I wasn't wrong when I said that. Uh, the fact that this guy can't see it is uh, rather amazing. So anyway, his point is anyway that we, we hoaxed ourselves. So I'm not going to just keep reading all of this garbage that he wrote. You know, what did the Mein Kampf articles actually prove. Ironically, they showed that the journals they targeted rejected both of their papers. No, they rejected the stupid autoethnography. Only after major revisions to one of the texts and after having been emptied of all traces of Nazi ideology except the exact same logic, the exact same racial scapegoating, the exact same mentality, the exact same demand for absolute solidarity, uh, the exact same anger, the exact same self-righteousness, the exact same unwillingness to consider uh, compromise. There will be no half measures. Yeah. All traces of Nazi ideology, nice historian studying Hitler that can't identify what Nazi ideology really is unless it's literally Nazi ideology. Uh, so it proved a remarkable resilience on the part of these journals to withstand pseudoscientific bullshit. No, it didn't. We got seven fucking papers in. What are you talking about? We had four more, at least maybe five that would have got in as well. What it did not prove a remarkable resilience on the part of these journals. As a matter of fact, it's even better than that. We had zero papers accepted 
up through Thanksgiving, as I said. Then we started working hard to rewrite and to learn the material and start doing it. Almost every paper we wrote after that, and certainly every paper we wrote starting in like February, was either going to was either in or going to get in. We were up to a very high acceptance rate. We got they, these journals showed no resilience to withstand pseudoscientific bullshit. Absolutely none. Zero. And what's scary is I could write papers for major medical journals like The Lancet, which publishes this crap all the time now, or the New England Journal of Medicine, which publishes this crap in every issue now, possibly even significant scientific journals outside of medicine. At this point, there is no resilience whatsoever to any journal that gets hit with stuff of this type. This pseudoscientific race baiting nonsense, the critical constructivist nonsense. Uh, maybe you could still have that in physics and math journals. The very hardest of sciences wouldn't accept even a commentary piece, but we're up to medical journals now. We see stuff like this coming up to a degree within when scientific journals like Nature. So there's very little, very little resilience and no resilience in the 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 journals in the discipline. They did show resilience in not being willing to accept hoax papers, which is why we said from the beginning, including in our press release, don't call these hoaxes. They're not hoaxes. It's very important we don't call them hoaxes. Yasha Monk comes out and says, Sokol squared, Alan Sokol, uh, great hoax artist. Hoaxes, hoaxes, hoaxes. No, they weren't hoaxes. The hoaxes failed. Um, so this is just utter nonsense, right? So he goes into the rest of the obfuscation. We don't have to read the rest of this. He's based, a historian based in Stockholm, Sweden, specializing in Hitler and National Socialism. Real good specialization. Moron can't even tell the freaking thesis of what Hitler's anti-Semitism looked like if, it, if it's put on like a dress. He can't tell the difference. You put Hitler in a dress and this guy can't find him. He's a Hitler scholar. Come on. What a fucking joke. Okay, so that said... Let's talk about this remarkable resilience, because there were seven papers that were accepted, not just this one. We've already talked at length about the dog sex paper. Let me just kind of give a quick rundown on the others that got accepted, if I can even do this from memory. It's been so freaking long ago, this guy's excavating this crap to try to dredge it up. It's probably Wikipedia activism. It's probably to put an article out here that's going to be able to disparage what we did in Wikipedia. Now, I wouldn't even have brought it up except the very smart people, who are, of course, my favorite people, uh, fucking useful idiots, the very smart people decided that what was most important to do next would, of course, be to say, ha ha! Lindsay and company sucked all along, like we've always said. Who am I talking about? Let's name some very smart people. Jesse Single, who crapped on our project when we first published it back in 2018, crapped on our project consistently ever since, crapped on our project last week when this stupid article came out. Jesse Clueless Single, very good. Stuart Ritchie, same thing, crapped on it at the time, still crapping on it. Okay, so there's a couple of very smart people we can name them. Uh, they think they're very smart. They don't know what's going on. They didn't understand what we did. They still don't understand what we did, but they saw this piece come out that doesn't understand what we did and decided to jump on it and say, ha ha, we told you all along. Lindsay and company didn't didn't know what they're doing. So let's talk about this remarkable resilience and the six other papers. Well, we'll skip the dog park. We already talked about the dog park. Um, the most important paper we have that people haven't talked about much or at all was the one that got into Hypatia and got accepted by Hypatia. When the joke's on you was the title of it. <laughs> And so that was the one where we argued that you're not allowed to make fun. It's unethical to make fun of or to use humor against social justice or critical social justice initiatives. But they can use humor against you um, and everything else. So they can use humor for social justice, but it's inappropriate to for critical social justice, but it's inappropriate to use humor against it. And in that paper, which was titled When the Joke's on You, if you recall, before this whole project, Peter and I did a previous hoax attempt called the, Crit uh, the Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct. So we argued about South Park, we argued about The Simpsons, we, talk, we argued about humor in general. You know, this long argument, Helen actually wrote the majority of it, and it was brilliant. Um, we secretly referred to this paper as a hoax on hoaxes, because it's uh, when we first wrote the very first draft of it, we were doing hoaxes, um, and then we couldn't do anything with it, so we killed it. Uh, and then Helen was able to resurrect the argument in this feminist theory uh, thing to, to split humor. And then the very last section in the paper, what we actually target is using academic hoaxes as a form of inappropriate humor to challenge critical social justice. So we make the argument from their perspective 
against the project that we're doing. So we already made their best argument against us in a paper making fun of them titled When the Joke's on You. And going even further, we actually cited the conceptual penis. So Peter and I cited ourselves in this paper. Helen, we I think we maybe, I don't recall if we cited one of uh, Helen's uh, support for us, but we cited ourselves in this paper saying that what we did, we criticized ourselves, our previous work, we said that this is horrible, we criticized the work that, technically the work that we were doing at the time, the whole project in which this was embedded, and this got very little attention. The idea that you are not allowed to make fun of something is a big deal. And then the fact that we were able to go completely meta with it is kind of cool too. And you know, that we criticized our own. They say that if you, you know, you don't really know something unless you can give the criticism of it from the other side. We gave their criticism of our work and got them to accept it as a important contribution to feminist philosophy. So that was one of the other papers. We had fat bodybuilding, which every time people find out about this, they crack up, they lose it. Fat bodybuilding. We argued, and this was accepted by the journal Fat Studies, which really does exist, um, which does not study medical issues around being fat. It studies uh, critical theory of being fat. In other words, it says that obesity is a medicalizing narrative that's used. It's not a health problem. It's used to make fat people feel bad when they go to the doctor. And so it's not appropriate. So they call themselves fat instead of obese. They, do, they would not say that they're overweight because that would imply that there's a correct weight. This is a real discipline, or no, let's not call it a discipline. This is a real field of study that exists, a critical study of fat, fat studies. And their flagship journal is called Fat Studies. And we wrote a paper claiming that we were, we actually had a guy that Peter is friends with named Richard Baldwin, who is a real professional bodybuilder. He was a Mr. Northern Hemisphere in the 70s or something like that. Um... Is probably, I think he has like a nickname like the Modern Apollo, and like this guy's jacked. And, and he's a retired professor of history from Florida. He said we could use his name and his, his, his affiliation to kind of get under the radar. So we wrote a paper from the perspective of a professional bodybuilder saying that professional bodybuilding as a sport is fat phobic and therefore bigoted unless it opens the door to a new category of competition that's not a competition called fat bodybuilding, where people do not compete and bodies of any sizes are welcome to get on stage in fat shun, that's fat, F-A-T, shun, like fashion, but with fat at the beginning, which is what they call fat people clothes. Um, they can wear fat shun of their choice and bodies of any size can enter and it won't be competitive and nobody will actually be judged, but they're going to get up and do an exhibition of fat and fatness for everybody. And if professional bodybuilding as a sport doesn't admit this, then it's fat phobic, uh, and promotes thin normativity, extreme thin norm normativity and all this. And it betrays itself because, um, bodybuilders bodies are big too. And what's the difference? You know, muscle is tissue, fat is tissue. It's all the same. Um, we, we question in that paper, you know, what is the ontology, the fundamental ontology of what it means to build a body? So we actually do claim that you can build a fat body just like you build a muscular body and that building a fat body is just as valid. And in fact, it's maybe even more valid because you're now do, making a political statement with it. So you're building a politicized fat body. I don't, I'm not kidding. So they accepted this paper. They thought it was great. So fat bodybuilding, that paper in the first draft, we had the last section that we said that fat body is, bodybuilding is the final frontier for fat, uh, riffing off of Star Trek, which Peter's a big fan of. So it was like a little Easter egg for him. And they, one of the reviewers got really mad about that. And they said that we couldn't say final because that would imply that there's an end to fat, fat activism, which will never end. And we couldn't say frontier because that reminds people of genocides of the Native Americans. So we couldn't use the word frontier and had to choose a different word. So we had to rewrite the entire last section to avoid using the word frontier because it reminded the reviewer of genocides. Um, no kidding. And so the fat bodybuilding. So that was one. Let me see if I can remember some more of these. We had the paper that we referred affectionately, <laughs> Helen was horrified to, as dildos, where we argued that that straight men could overcome their transphobia by practicing by, in other words, by inserting objects into their butts. Um, and we wrote this long argument that we claimed to interview people who we had no business interviewing some conservatives who said that they didn't want to be a part of some stupid liberal study about shoving things up your ass. Um, and we interviewed these, like this one guy's just totally wild and was like, you know, oh, I'll stick anything up there. I'm up for anything. <laughs> I hurt myself a few times even. And then another guy who, uh, was like, I'm not sticking anything up there. There's poop up there. And, you know, just like ridiculous stuff. And they took this very seriously. So that paper got uh, accepted by a journal uh, called Sexuality and Culture. 
it is not a number one journal, but it's it's next to sexualities, which I think is the number one journal in sexuality studies. It coined a new term. This is actually from the reviewer, trans hysteria. Uh, there's a term in the literature called homo hysteria that we relied on in the paper, which is that apparently straight guys have this, you know, hysterical fear that if they do anything even re- remotely related to being gay, that they might become gay or be identified as gay. So there's this hysteria around homophobia. And so we created a parallel concept of trans hysteria and that sticking things in your butt would obviously possibly cause, uh, cause somebody to feel trans hysteria or that trans hysteria was the problem. Um, that paper was billed by its review, one of the reviewers literally, and I quote as an important contribution to knowledge. So that paper was, uh, also accepted. We had, how many have we got now? Uh, we had a paper, um, that was a re- it was a investigation of the culture in restaurants. Hooters restaurants were what we modeled it after. We claimed that we recorded every. We went to the Hooters weekly with our Brazilian Jiu Jitsu friends <laughs> and recorded every one of our table conversations. And I just wrote the most lewd and ridiculous uh, dialogue that we recorded. And of course, the point for this paper was that we cherry picked like the crude stuff and then said that that's emblematic of guy culture and that the restaurant environment encourages that rather hilariously. We, we submitted this paper. Uh, the point of the paper in terms of what did we do wrong was that we grotesquely cherry picked data. That was what it, what it was about. And we sent this paper off to men and masculinities because it was a study of masculinity and a feminist got a hold of it um, and reviewed it and was very angry that we focused on the men rather than the women. So that paper got rejected because we didn't focus on the the women. We focused on the men instead. Um, so we ended up getting it off to another journal. It's even of higher stature called Sex Roles, and Sex Roles accepted it uh, after quite a bit of work. Um, but kind of funny in that was that one of the editor's comments was I always something along the lines of I always suspected I've never been to one of these restaurants, but I always suspected that it was really like this. It's even worse than I thought, you know, and it's like, so we just played into their stereotype about the restaurants. I mean, I've been to Hooters hundreds of times in my life. It's typically like pretty normal and friendly and there's families and stuff. It's pretty, it's not like this weird, uh, it's not like a strip club, but we painted it out to be like the most seedy gross strip club ever. And guys acting like really macho. We said that the point of going is to order women around playing on a pun of like the waitress has to take your order, um, when you order your food. And so that we said that it plays into a male fantasy that they get to order pretty young women around and they have to do what they're told, uh, which is a pun on the word order. And they thought that that was brilliant. Um, so that paper got accepted, (laughs) that paper, uh, that paper I thought was really funny. Um, we had another paper that's probably the funniest thing I've ever written, they got accepted. That was the moon meanings, meetings and the meaning of sisterhood or something like that. It was a uh, poetic inquiry is what the discipline or the, the approach is called. So it was all these poems. What I did was I took the, um, there's a random teenage angst poetry generator I found online and it writes these horrific random poem poems. So I just took a bunch of those and I strung them together and I wrote these six poems and I linked them to I just edited those so that they actually were readable and I, but they were just the random generated poems. They were terrible. And I named them after different phases of the moon. And I wrote in between this absolutely insane. You should just go read it. I won't, shouldn't even quote from it, you know, monologue of a bitter divorced feminist in her moon meetings where they would gather it and have a vulva shrine and they would have their womb room and they would drink symbolic menstrual menstrual blood made out of red wine port and motherwort tincture and they would celebrate the crones and they would drink to their periods and they would you know do all this crazy stuff and they had all these on the vulva shrine they had all these um you know pieces of wood and like stones and flowers and things they found that look like vulvas and the, they collected them and like just totally mental illness and uh <laughs> this got accepted with no revisions um so you know, there's a pretty broad spectrum. I think I've left one out that got accepted. Uh, let me let me count them off. So there's the dog sex, there's the dildos, there's the fat bodybuilding, jokes on you, Hitler, uh, moon meetings. Yeah, so this is the thing that happens. I've actually forgotten what the seventh one is without looking right off the top of my head because um, it's been two and a half years and this guy still wants to excavate this stuff. Uh, so 
if you can remember what it is, I'll remember as soon as I stop recording. You can laugh about it for yourself there too. Um, maybe I actually can pull it up out of this uh, article real quick. So there was a lot more going on there. And there was also, like I said, there was like four other papers or maybe five that would have possibly got in had we uh, had a few more months, had the Wall Street Journal not caught us, which was result, which was the result, I should say, of um, the dog sex paper being absolutely too crazy, um, which it was. It was absolutely too insane. Uh, and so it attracted the attention of journalists, got the Wall Street Journal involved, um, and one thing led to another, and we were busted. So let's see. Dog park, dildos, feminist mind conf. We've covered the fat body building. I found the list. Jokes on you. Uh, Hooters. Oh, it was Hooters and movie meetings. So that was all of them. Yeah. So that's all seven that got accepted. Uh, like I said, there was a scary progressive stack paper about chaining people to the floor. Hypatia, the leading feminist philosophy journal, was was very warm to that and said we shouldn't center compassion because that would recenter the needs of the privilege. We wrote a paper about feminist artificial intelligence and said that our AI was going to destroy the world because it would be too masculine. And so we needed to make it feminist and irrational to protect the world. Uh, we wrote a paper about porn and implicit bias where we literally claimed that we watched 2,328 hours of hardcore pornography over the course of a year and took the... <laughs> took the implicit association test before and after every viewing session um, <laughs> for four hours a day. Uh, oh, man, that was a thing. And we had a number of other papers, feminist astronomy that mirrored the feminist glaciology paper and so on. So certainly the claim that, that these disciplines showed, or these journals, I should say, in these fields showed tremendous resilience against pseudoscientific bullshit is, is preposterous. We showed, I think, without any or beyond any shadow of a doubt that sophistry will fly starting with your conclusion and working backwards will fly you do however have to actually engage the literature there you do have to play the game you do have to speak their language they do know what they're talking about you cannot hoax them so this is kind of a recap of two and a half years ago of the uh, grievance studies affair uh, and but then the most important point here was contrary, I guess, for this particular podcast, because it's responding to this article that Mein Kampf and the Feminazis are Hitler hoax. It's very different from the way that this piece characterized it. What we were attempting to do and what we did is very different from the way it was presented here. What we achieved, I think, is significant. It is not a literal rewrite of Mein Kampf. We did not literally get a journal to publish Mein Kampf. We never claimed that this was the case. We were quite circumspect about the paper when we published it or got it published or accepted, I should say. It didn't ever get published. And we um, definitely maintained Hitler's attitude, his ethos, his anger, his grievance, um, his reasoning, his rationale, the very structure of what it means to build a movement. And then contrary to the most hilarious assertion, and we'll close up here, the most hilarious assertion in this essay is, of course, we picked the least bad part of Hitler. Oh, no. And that being, and th th this argument bears repeating one last time, we did chapter 12, which is like the least bad chapter but if you understand that chapter 12 exists in the context of being after chapter 11, which is easily the worst chapter, it is the uh, <laughs> folk and uh, race chapter that rails on the Jews 360 times or thereabouts, and the context of chapters 1 through 10 that build up to chapter 11 and then go into chapter 12. If you understand that chapter 12 exists in the context of being preceded by Here's all my problems. Here's my struggle. And the Jews are the worst of all of it. That's the end of chapter 11. Now we need to do something about it. We need a movement. That's chapter 12. That's the chapter we rewrote. When you understand it in that context, this argument to try to hide the significance of what we did, and I don't want to overstate it, is just dangerous. It's not even stupid. It's dangerous. It is dangerously stupid because we're seeing similar logic, similar scapegoating, similar the similar structure of, of an argument that we need this, we have a race that is now hoarding resources, that has the height of privilege, that doesn't deserve it, that's boxing out others, that needs to be scapegoated in society as the root of all problems. Whiteness is the root of all problems. And what we now need is a movement that's absolutely intolerant, doesn't accept compromise or half measures, 
and is absolutely based on on you know solidarity within itself to uh, to to make up for the damage to take on and remake the world against the damage caused by the the racial group that is being scapegoated when you understand that that's the context of what that paper is actually doing, that what the argument that paper is actually making, and where that paper sits, being that it is the movement that is the answer, it is it's a rewrite of the movement that is the answer to the problem that Hitler calls his struggle, which culminates with a chapter of unbridled anti-Semitism, uh, the likes of which the world has rarely seen. The chapter we rewrote is supposed to be Hitler's answer to that Jewish problem. We just changed it from Jew to white in some very meaningful sense, or Hitler's enemies to uh, to 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 uh, specifically to choice feminism, to freedom, and neoliberal feminism. In other words, capitalism. Uh, it's a scarier thing than this guy wants to portray. Uh, again, this guy portrays himself as a Hitler scholar. There's absolutely no evidence to believe that he's a credible one. Um, he got his piece out of it. A couple of very smart people got to publish their little like dunks. And so I felt the need to offer an answer. So this is what's really going on. This is more of the history of the Grievance Studies Affair. I know I've talked about it on a billion podcasts, but I've never just talked about it myself. Um, sooner or later, I actually, just as an enticement to close this up, I actually kept a diary for a, most of the time that this project went on. It totals up 30,000 words or so. Sooner or later, I'm going to start publishing that for you. I'll let you see my diary just as my thoughts developed as I went through this project, not really knowing what was going on, not really understanding the field. It's I haven't released it yet partly because it doesn't like it doesn't I don't think it helps people to see how I came to understand it given that I didn't understand it. I don't want to get incorrect information about the movement uh, the woke movement out there right now. Um, but it I think will be interesting reading for people when we do finally when I do finally choose to release it. So look forward to that and thank you for listening. Thank you for joining me on this rather long episode of the New Discourses podcast where we talked about the grievance studies affair and our infamous intersectional feminist rewrite of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf which was accepted again by the Feminist Social Work Journal Affilia. 